Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, happy afternoon, I hope. Midnights for some of you. Um, different times of day in New Zealand. Hello to the future. <laughs> um, I think if we, if, I'm just going to start off slow because I know it always takes people a few minutes um, to get into these um, get into these little sessions. So while that happens, um, hello and welcome to our session on rebalancing the internet economy, a closer look at the Australian news media bargaining code. Um, we are going to be looking at a little bit of the bargaining code <clears throat> because it had such a huge impact on the digital rights space internationally. We at Digital Rights Watch got a huge amount of questions from our international community. Um, we were pinged by everyone we knew to explain what was happening. So we thought, what a great time to bring it to um, the RightsCon program and just um, have, a, have a discussion. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. We can't see them live, but we have a wonderful technical moderator, Cassandra, shout out and thank you, um, who will be putting those in a little doc for us to see. So if you have a question at any time, pop it in there and we'll just get through it um, during the one hour that we're gonna spend together. I don't think we're gonna do a dedicated Q&A at the end. So just fire them at us as we go through. Um, so I am Lucy Krolceva. I'm the executive director at Digital Rights Watch. Um, and you can't see my co-conspirators here. Um, so maybe as I say your names and stuff, just like unmute and briefly just say hello and wave so people can put a face to the, to the person. Um, I'm joined today by Rebecca Giblin, who is ARC Future Fellow and the Associate Professor within the Melbourne Law School. Um, and most interestingly, um, Rebecca <laughs> just finished writing together with Corey Doctorov um, a book called The Shakedown which touches on a lot of the topics um, that we're gonna be discussing here and the whole idea of rebalancing um, the ecosystem. So we're super excited um, to have Rebecca with us. We're really excited about the book, which I believe is gonna come out next year. So this is like your little amuse-bouche for what's to come. Rebecca, can you like do a hello and just a wave? <laughs> Hi everyone. Yay, thank you. Cool, um, and the other esteemed co-conspirator I have here with me is Elizabeth O'Shea, who um, I wrote into the RightsCon program as a writer and an independent apparently, but who is uh, a principal lawyer in Maurice Blackburn's class action practice. Most importantly, however, she's the chair of Digital Rights Watch um, and an author of another wonderful book called Future Histories. So this is like giving me um, an inferiority complex because I didn't write a book yet and I'm joined here by two incredibly smart people who did. Um, but Lizzie, can you also give a little bit of a... Hi everybody. Hi Lucy. You don't need to feel inferior at all. We're very glad that you've put on this session and you're going to run it expertly, I'm sure. Well, what a... Thank you. What a review. <laughs> Um, so this is great. Um, it feels surreal not to be able to actually see everyone we're talking to. I find that very like, it's like, it is really like we're recording a podcast at this point. So I'm just going to lean into that. I have my pro mic set up here. Um, so for those of you who are new to Australian policy landscape, really, <laughs> welcome. Um, but what I guess what we wanted to bring closer with this um, was uh, you know, at the time uh, when the news media bargaining code was happening, Digital Rights Watch was publishing um, a lot of um, submissions and we published explainers. Lizzie and I participated in a whole bunch of um, tech talks here and, and sort of policy discussions that we had at the time, but we just didn't feel like there was enough um, representation of that in the international space. So we're going to just give you a little bit of a rundown of how that unfolded and uh, why the Australian mm -hmm. government um, sort of took this direction, what else we can expect down the road. Um, and I think we're going to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes on that uh, with Lizzie and I, and then we're going to just pull in Rebecca and her wonderful brain and expertise. And we're going to just talk about that entire um, uh, ecosystem and, and what rebalancing the internet economy could really look like. Um, so that's, that's going to be the structure. I'm going to do my best um, to stick to time, Lord knows. Lord knows I'm not great at it. Um, so let me just kick off and then I'll punt to Lizzie. Uh, the 
there's um uh, there's sort of a, a longer process that the news media bargaining code emerged out of. Um, and that's Australia's um, consumer regulator, the ACCC, um, published this huge, huge, huge 100 uh, page report on um, the digital platforms inquiry, um, basically looking at the entire ecosystem um, and how it could be um, tweaked, shall we say, um, or improved to serve um, serve consumers. There's different aspects in there. Obviously, there's a whole bit on privacy and how the infrastructure here in Australia, where we don't have a federal um, uh, charter of human rights, um, we, we just we, we lack a little bit of um, the sort of infrastructure you might be familiar with if you're sitting in the US or Europe. Um, so it has a lot of proposals on that front. But one of the pieces that it kind of put forward was this idea um, that the advertising space has really moved away from press and traditional media. And um, the tech companies should do should have a bigger responsibility at addressing that and actually pouring some cash um, into the pockets of, um, of the regular traditional good old school media. Um, that obviously brings in a whole different set of power dynamics. Um, and that was one of the things that we at Digital Rights Watch caught on. Um, and I wonder, Lizzie, do you want to jump in and start talking with me a little bit about what the big issue of that framing is and the idea of redistributing from the, the uh, basically just trying to balance big tech and media and where it left the actual individuals, which is out of the equation, I think. Yeah, uh, so the competition and consumer regulator here is perceived, I think, globally as being um, relatively assertive or creative or keen to enter the space to address the problems with dominance of large digital platforms. So this report uh, focused on Facebook and Google, but there was obviously an intent to consider how large digital platforms are too powerful uh, generally, uh, and, but this was the starting point. The, the News Media Bargaining Code, which came about as a result, was just one of many proposals, as Lucy mentioned. Um, I do think it's interesting and worthy of attention from people in other jurisdictions because, well, for a couple of reasons, the first one being that we know some other jurisdictions are already looking at this as an antidote to various social problems they've encountered with the dominance of digital platforms. Um, and secondly, because the debate here was really dominated by the fact that both mainstream news outlets and um, uh, politicians had something to gain from pushing this proposal through and, and the debate I wouldn't describe as particularly elucidating or um, useful in a lot of ways. And so I think if this is something that you're potentially going to confront in your own country, it's worth getting on top of sooner rather than later so that you can enter the debate and participate in a meaningful way and using the lens of human rights, which I think is the most useful in this context. But that's the first point to start with. This was not a human rights proposal or it wasn't um, uh, created with that context in mind. It was very much about consumer and competition law and particularly competition law. So the design of this bargaining code was essentially to rebalance the power dynamic that exists between digital platforms, Facebook and Google being the most obvious, and traditional news media. Uh, so publications run by people like Rupert Murdoch and the like. Australia has one of the most concentrated media landscapes in the world. Uh, so there are several large companies that produce a large amount of mainstream media. And then of course, there's plenty of other people who do this using the internet in all sorts of creating creative and interesting ways. But um, the, and we'll get to them later, I'm sure. But the idea of this particular proposal was that that, that dynamic needs to be rebalanced. Traditionally, the revenue that went to media companies or I'm loath to call them legacy media companies, but newspapers and the like, um, was uh, derived from advertising revenue. A huge amount of that advertising revenue has now been diverted in the wake of the digital age to platforms like Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the question was, how do we address the problem of underfunding of mainstream media and the power and dominance of a, a small number of digital platforms who then, according to traditional media companies, made money off content that was produced by them but didn't pay for it uh, because it created engagement on their platforms uh, and the advertising revenue flowed to those platforms instead of to the, to, to the traditional media companies. So that's the perspective that it comes from. Um, and in that, I think there are a couple of implicit assumptions. And I'm sure Lucy can expand on this as, or she'll jump in if, if I'm talking too much. But uh, one of the most obvious is that that 
mode of operating where uh, companies profit uh, by surveilling their consumers and collecting data for the purposes of creating curated audiences for certain kinds of products. That model essentially of surveillance capitalism that's been adopted by Facebook and Google, essentially what traditional mainstream media companies wanted was to get in on that, that action that they had traditionally taken revenue from advertising, they'd watch that go to, to digital platforms and they wanted to get in on that rather than, say, someone stepping back and going, oh, maybe our digital spaces could be ones in which we get to pursue our autonomy, um, our a sense of surprise and serendipity. We get to explore different ways of engaging with mainstream news issues and uh, different ways in which could be presented by alternative voices. Instead, what we saw was setting up a system where the model would return to how it was, which is gatekeepers of, um, of news being mainstream, traditional mainstream organ news organisations, getting in on the action of advertising revenue that had been diverted to digital platforms. And that starting point to me was um, where a lot of the trouble began because consumers then were, and, and people with rights, you know, who wanted to engage in online life without necessarily being exploited or being sold to all the time, uh, missed out on being part of that conversation because it wasn't really addressed to them and their concerns weren't put at the forefront. It was much more about how can we give power back to traditional media organisations in without necessarily questioning what was wrong with some of the ways in which they might have made money in the past and in the present um, through digital platforms. Yeah, and at the thanks, Lizzie. That was I would I wouldn't dare jump into that. That was a wonderful um, rundown. Um, that that was obviously for us the biggest issue is that it entrenched it entrenches that model, um, which I think a lot of us here at RightsCon would find um, you know extremely exploitative and and harmful to begin with. So it really um, rather than and there were a lot of recommendations in that inquiry which would have um, I think where. where which is why we called for them to start with a privacy reform and actually start thinking about data protection, uh, because really what we've done now is, is um, given the media a new tap to drink from, uh, entrenching that business model, and really, um, I think, getting to an unshakable um, place almost, because the, you know, and that to me was the hardest thing, and I, I'm worried that we're going to see it replicated in other parts of the world, but the media and the reporters who are, who should be a sort of neutral um, place to sort of report um, on this type of stuff are set to gain the most from it. Um, so I really struggled actually with the discourse that happened here um, in the news media because I found it, it, it incredibly biased to, to sort of serving this up as, as somehow revolutionary. And I think that's, you know, what you guys saw internationally as well. It was really served up as this huge sort of move and em empowering um, government versus big tech. Um, and while I think we all agreed that that's like, we want the governments to regulate the heck out of a big tech. Um, this to us just like did it the exact one way we probably wouldn't have wanted to see it happen. Yeah. Um, and, and that bombastic presentation to the world um, of this being the really like, this is what people need is the government sticking up for them like that. I think to me, that was a part of the problem. And a part of the reason I wanted to have this rights concession, just so you guys see a little bit under the surface of what it was like for us as digital rights advocates at the time. Does that sound right? I think, just, um, oh, oh, go on. Sorry, just a, a tiny bit of context as well, just when we think about what we are entrenching um, with this particular business model. You know, we, we saw from that Vice investigation last year that um, coverage around George Floyd's death, for example, was monetized at, I think it was 57% lower rates than other sort of more anodyne type of content. Queer and trans content, you know, all gets um, demonetized. And so it really encourages these businesses as well to be providing a certain kind of news. So when we think about the business model that's being entrenched and the kinds of news that comes out of it, um, there's a lot more to it um, than than simply the issues that appear on the surface. It's really fundamentally, it's a question of, you know, when people call to fund news, I don't think that they're necessarily thinking about the kind of news that is being funded under this existing business model. Yeah, there's definitely, the, the case can be definitely made that this incentivizes a certain kind of engagement with online news content that is just not what we need more of, you know, that there's, 
um, it, th there was a lot of talk around it being a pay per link so that you would uh, be charged per link that you post on a social media platform that news organization could then go to charge the uh, platform for that content and you know this was the one of the ways in which the model of this law was designed to operate it, it doesn't end up operating in that way it's it's a boring complicated reason that the legislation was actually used more as a stick, as a threat, that it, that these companies will be regulated than actually used in practice. But the model still sits there, and that's the perception of monetization: that the more people click on news content, the more valuable it is for the news media organisations to make. And now they've got that entrenched in an agreement where they get paid with these kinds of parameters being in mind, even if they may not be specifically in each agreement. Uh, and that is not the kind of news content we need. Um, uh, it's really then does prioritise news content that's based on engagement rather than, say, the public interest. Um, yeah, so there's there's lots to talk about there. The, the, to return to the politics just quickly, I, I did just want to point out for advocates who are interested in this space that uh, a huge amount of territory was gained for politicians by um, demonising tech platforms. And that uh, is a legitimate, uh, the, a lot of the criticism that was contained in that politicking was quite legitimate. Like I think it is fair to say that tech platforms have too much money, have too much power, um, incentivise certain kinds of engagement over others. Um, and, and there's all sorts of problems that don't pay enough tax. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a legitimate criticism, but um, their failure to step up to the plate in terms of behaving better as companies um, has consequences for us all because it allows then the debate to be obscured. Uh, and, you know, we ended up uh, opposing the proposal, of course, uh, which meant that people thought that we were siding with big tech, which we're obviously a... a um, a critic of big tech a lot of the time as a digital rights organisation because we think that they could do better on a range of fronts. Uh, and so I do think there's a politi political dynamic here where politicians see problems that they don't particularly want to take responsibility for and it's easy to outsource that blame to large tech platforms and tech digital rights activists often end up having to do the heavy lifting of explaining why opposing a political program, um, even if it might be ostensibly on the, in the interest of big tech is actually more complex than that. And that's important to remember, I think, if you're going to be engaging in a debate like this in your own country. Yeah, and I think that um, absolutely. Um, and I would say that uh, portrayal of it's David versus Goliath. And in this instance, the traditional media outlets being David was very cute. <laughs> it's, yeah, um, I don't think like, many people think of Rupert Murdoch as David in the David and Goliath battle, <laughs> but that's how it was framed for sure. Yeah. So if you, if you were here and you were watching the debate unfold, you were just sort of like, are you, <laughs> are you serious? Um, so yeah, th this was uh, particularly, I think, um, concerning, and it's exactly the sort of thing that we got a lot of questions from um, sort of the digital rights community about, um, and people weren't sure where it needs to stand. There was also, um, you know, a bit in that proposal about the platforms having to share um, a bit about their algorithm changes, and so a little bit of algorithmic transparency that I think captured a lot of people's attention, um, and so it was it was very hard for us to find a nuanced narrative. Obviously we want that, um, even though it was drafted in a little bit of a, a funky way. Um, obviously that's you know something that uh, this community has been uh, pushing for. So as Lizzie says, it was really, we were really just doing the balancing act for many months of trying to uh, be like, there are, there are good initiatives here, but you're really starting from a weird place. Um, and I can't imagine um, that the people who are gonna get these sort of big deals with um, with the tech companies are gonna come to our aid as journalists um, in, in future times when we argue against these business models. So it really um, has put us on a bit of a tricky um, back burner in that way. Um, I would also say at this moment in time, in this direction here, <laughs> to this side of the screen, um, there are links in there. Um, so there's a link to our own explainer on this topic. So if you wanna see um, the submissions there that we did to the inquiry, but also like a little colorful explainer <laughs> that we did for our socials. So if you want to see what exactly what we were concerned about in that debate, you can do that. Um, there's also a link there to the shakedown and a little bit of a um, thread um, on what we're just going to be talking about shortly. So um, feel free to, to look to this. I'm pretty sure it's mirror image. I'm pretty sure I'm pointing in the right direction. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> pretty sure it's in here. Um, yeah, so take advantage of those links. And again, if you have questions, feel free 
to throw them at us. Um, and I guess on this note, um, I didn't want to spend too much on the media bargaining code. So I'm happy to zoop, zoom out a little bit. And, um, you know, for us at Digital Rights Watch, this has really prompted an interesting um, topic because the Australian government clearly has an appetite um, to step up to some of these regulating big tech um, challenges, as um, uh, which isn't necessarily as speedy in other jurisdictions that have big, bigger legislatures. Um, so in a way, it's a unique opportunity. As Lizzie said, um, some politicians really gained a bit of clout um, during this time. So we, we kind of see this um, opportunity of actually thinking through um, what it would look like um, more productively to rethink the balance, the balance of the scales on the internet and this entire ecosystem. And so incredibly delighted to have Rebecca with us who already chimed in. Um, but Rebecca, you spent like a great deal of time during your lockdown, which was long here in Melbourne, <laughs> many months, um, thinking through some of these issues. Do you want to, do you want to give us a little bit of a global perspective? Yeah, sure. I just I want to first just recognize that I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nations where sovereignty was never ceded um, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as their future warriors. Um, yes, uh, so Corey and I spent a lot of last year dealing with these questions um, because we had just grown so incredibly frustrated with this discourse that pitted um, creators <laughs> versus users, uh, which is obviously a false dichotomy in so many different ways. Um, but then uh, obviously that results in a really polarized and toxic kind of discourse um, where, as you were just talking about, Lucy, it, it becomes really difficult to have a nuanced narrative where you're talking about, well, there's some things here that are good and some things here that are bad because everybody else, it, it feels like, wants to know if you're with them or against them. Um, and so what we were trying to do here is, um, you know, just really frustrated with this, with this false dichotomy and wanting to move away from this creators versus users framing and towards really what we saw as the crux of the matter, which is excessive bigness. And what's happening in news is what's happening throughout the entire creative ecosystem, particularly online. We have uh, creative workers being told that their problems will be fixed if only they get more copyright rights or stronger digital locks or if the internet gets filtered. Um, but the real reason uh, that they earn so little of the value from the culture that they create is that the most profitable supply chains have been colonised by really powerful corporations who manage to use their power to siphon off most of its value. And so it's not just Google and Facebook with news, it's Amazon with books, it's YouTube with online video, um, iHeartMedia for um, um, recorded music and, and radio, Live Nation for ticketing and live events, the big three record labels, Spotify, even the Hollywood talent agencies, they're all doing the same thing. Um, and Apple and, and Google, of course, are everything mobile. And what, what they're doing is they're using all kinds of tools to lock in users, then lock in suppliers like creative workers um, and then um, using their power to lock out potential competitors from their markets. And then once they've got all that power, um, using it to squeeze down the prices that are paid to unsustainable levels. And so when it's sellers who've got lots of power over buyers, we call it a monopoly. But when it's buyers who've got power over sellers, we call it a monopsony, which is just, I think we can agree, just frankly, it's not a great word. Um, people don't love it, but we all need to get used to this word, I think, because it's such, um, such an important concept that explains a lot of things that are happening to all of us and that are going to keep happening to all workers, you know, as we kind of progress through the stage of late capitalism. And this, this concept was first noticed and first named by an economist called... Um, Joan Robinson, who was working at the University of Cambridge in the 1930s. Um, and what she argued is that monopsony is actually really, really dangerous for workers, right? They're the ones um, who are at the greatest risk because it's usually employers who've got, the, who've got all of the power. Um, and that's one reason why we should really be paying very close attention to it now, but it's also one reason 
um, why uh, one way in which we can explain what's going on now in all of these creative labor markets. And the point is, and I guess the issue is that once a buyer becomes sufficiently powerful, like, like Amazon is with books or like uh, um, uh, Apple and Google are with apps or just like um, Facebook and Google are with online ads, they've got the ability to do all kinds of things that they wouldn't be able to do in a creative market. And so what we need to, to do, I think, is to think about how do we change this power balance? And crucially, I think it can't be about treating the symptoms. Treating the symptoms, uh, one of the things that we ended up doing with the news media bargaining code, um, we didn't get, I, I think the news media bargaining code is interesting because it did get closer to addressing some of the causes um, than some other uh, regulatory interventions have done. Um, let me talk about one uh, that I think is a particular failure. So for example, the EU's internet filters out of the digital single market directive, okay? Now, these were clearly intended to, to address the excessive power of, of companies like Google through YouTube, right? But the way that they did that um, through, for example, mandating that, that uh, videos be filtered, actually entrenched the bigness, right? They baked bigness in because the only companies that are able to actually do that are basically YouTube. Um, and so it means that we've got even less potential for competitors to come in and to address that, um, uh, that uh, landscape that uh, you know, leaves them with so much power. And so what we've got to do instead is we've got to think about, I think, regulatory responses that do get to the crux of the power. And, one of the reasons why the news media bargaining code was so interesting is because at least at, at first, when it was um, um, one of the earlier versions, the, that mandate about transparency, uh, that was a really interesting one about demanding that these companies make available some information about their algorithms and the effect of changes on their algorithms. Transparency is one of the most powerful tools that we have against, um, against monopsony, against excessive buyer power. Uh, and we see this, for example, there's a really terrific story that's been unfolding that Corey and I have been watching over the last few months around Amazon's um, Audible and the way in which they were completely ripping off um, authors and small publishers by allowing um, or, in fact, encouraging customers to return their audiobooks after they had finished listening to them for up to a year afterwards for a full refund. Um, and then clawing back the royalties from the creators. And they masked this by only ever reporting on net sales, right? So that nobody could see how many returns were being made. Although they might sometimes, you know, on their daily accounts, they might see there were minus three sales, for example, which, you know, you know it hinted that there were a lot of returns going on, but nobody knew the extent of it until there was a glitch that suddenly processed three weeks or three months worth of returns all in one day. And so suddenly the curtain was pulled aside and the authors were able to get a glimpse about what had been going on. And as soon as that happened, that little bit of transparency was enough for them to be able to more successfully mobilize and um, get Amazon and Audible to change their policies and to commit to more transparency. So we've got endless examples of why transparency is important and, and, and how it can help. Unfortunately, as the news media bargaining code was eventually passed, we, you know, we, the Australian government, I think, really did drop the ball on that. They, they gave in um, to the big tech platforms on that. But I think all initiatives that work towards transparency are a really good start for addressing this excessive power. But Perhaps that's where we could throw the conversation open to, to now. Like, you know, what are some of the other ways in which, you know, we can get to the root of these problems um, in, in ways that don't bake bigness in? Well, may I just say that I love bigness as <laughs> like a normalized term. Um, I wrote it down. I was like excessive bigness, just use that over and over. Um, yeah, I, you know, that was a part of the issue for us is that it did create um, a level of transparency, but it created that level of transparency for um, for the publishers and not necessarily um, towards the public. So they would get notified when changes are being made. They would get notified how the algorithm is 
getting changed. And, um, you know, we, it's something that I battled when I was still uh, during my time at Access Now, uh, still working in the EU. This is something that we struggled with as well is really um, getting that transparency and, and that understanding to people and how do you communicate that. Um, so, but I feel like I interrupted Lizzie as I started speaking, um, if you want to hop in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with transparency. I mean, I think in relation to news creation, um, part of my objection to the bargaining code as well, I suppose, was it set up a system of private transfer. So it's just money going from the big tech platforms to news media organisations and there's no sense of what, how much it was or what it would be spent on. And so, I mean, I would like to see some transparency in that respect, you know, what how, what kind of money is changing hands? Because we know it's large media organisations that make money out of this and they divert it into the pockets of shareholders rather than investing in high quality news or news where there's actual gaps like in regional and rural areas. I mean, I think there is a need to have um, an examination of the problem we're trying to solve in respect of news that probably does require also the stepping in of, of public funders um, and and at, at sufficient um, arm's length with independence to actually address that problem. Because at the moment, all we know is that, that platforms and large media organisations are exchanging money. And for, for, for that bargain, they're going to both keep quiet about any further reform in the space. And they've certainly got a common interest now in not dealing with privacy issues that might arise by the constant sharing of personal information about people who either read their stories or use their platforms. And so I, I completely understand how obscuring these issues is in the interests of these companies with excessive bigness um, who therefore get to reap the benefits without any accountability for it. I mean, I think um, given we just were talking a little bit about the power dynamics involved in, in some of the, in what comes with excessive bigness, the other thing to mention, and uh, sorry, the other, the other point that Rebecca raised was that if you're large enough, compliance with various regulatory ref, um, reforms becomes easier for you than it, it does for smaller organisations, which I think is something activists always need to keep in mind in this particular moment. The other point about this, I suppose, that is worth mentioning in relation to the bargaining code is the way in which this got onto the international, um, captured international attention was because Facebook took the very drastic move of stripping all news content off their platform in an effort to evade this regulation applying to them in certain ways. And it was an instance where um, Facebook, you know, weaponized their users to advance a political cause for the company and they were successful. So they managed to then dictate a certain aspect of the reform, particularly around transparency and the algorithm, but also generally the capacity to withdraw again from this particular legislative arrangement. So that they used their power, um, they used their users as a form of power to force politicians into drafting the regulations in a way that suited them and it was despicable behavior in my view uh, particularly in a context in which um, many uh, organizations were dependent on the platform for, for things like a vaccine rollout which is what we were starting at the time so kind of disgraceful behavior really but what that highlighted to me as well is that the solution isn't necessarily going to come from fixing that or, or asking platforms to behave better we also need to build um, the infrastructure to, for community organisations, for activists, for creators to be able to use these platforms on their own terms rather than handing over our power to them so that they could potentially kick us off the platform, strip our content away without any reference to us. And that's, I think, where some of the discussion that Rebecca was getting to is really important. How do we give back rights to people who are making content, who are, who are building the infrastructure of online life so that they don't become beholden to these large platforms who can then dictate the terms on which they share um, what they make and, and their effort that they put into building communities. And that really shows um, that, you know, that example, that disgraceful behaviour um, by Facebook, which in Australia, by the way, we call that chucking a hissy fit. Um, <laughs> a little bit of colloquialism here, um, it really shows that the, the power is, is too much, right? And I think one of the reasons why our competition regulator had to take this kind of creative path to addressing their power is because they're now so, so big and so powerful uh, that a country like Australia with 25 odd million people doesn't have the power to enforce some of the traditional antitrust or competition law remedies like breaking them up. So we've got to find other ways of addressing that. Uh, but we need to we need to be thinking much more creatively and aggressively about this. It's hard to leave Facebook, right? Because if you leave Facebook, 
you get um, excluded from social events. You can lose track with, of your friends and family, or, um, you know, overseas or even locally, especially um, since 2020, it's been really tricky. And so, you know, one of the things that Corey and I talk about doing is we need to reform the, the law around anti-circumvention of technological protection measures so that we can, people can write software that allows um, uh, allows people to take themselves out of Facebook while still um, being able to keep in contact with the people who are on there, which is you know, exactly the kind of thing that Facebook took advantage of when uh, it was trying to uh, rest away MySpace's um, social media dominance, but now nobody's allowed to do in response to it. And so getting, you know, thinking creatively about how do we get to the nub of, of breaking that power it's not just about, you know, one element. It's got to be a whole bunch of different things. So it has to be about, you know, introducing more transparency. Like where does the money go um, and who's getting it? It has to be about um, making it easier for people to break away from these platforms and, and not get locked in, which then makes it easier for suppliers to be able to break away from these platforms and not get locked in. I think as well, we should really be thinking about um, collective ownership and collective action here. I think that news has terrific potential for um, creating, you know, if news organizations were able to work together to mobilize and create their own ad networks, um, there's real potential there, I think, to, you know, cut at the, the core of Google's power, at least for online ads and create more transparency and make sure that more of each advertising dollar goes to them. Um, you know, at, at the start of this century, almost the, the full dollar of every advertising dollar went to news organizations and now up to 70 cents in the dollar gets diverted at different places along the way. Um, so there's lots of leakage there. Um, and, and by creating, you know, if, if there was um, cooperative behavior by the news organizations, to create their own ad network and platform, which uh, defeated some of the fraudulent and um, obfuscatory behavior of the platforms, you know, that would really help as well. So there's all kinds of things that, that we can be doing, but I think that really just needs to be a focus on cutting away at that power and not just treating the symptoms because by treating the symptoms, ultimately, the Australian government has, again, baked bigness in, right? Because now we've got this, the news ecosystem in Australia is, it, its um, economic viability is largely contingent now on keeping these companies alive and big and profitable so that they can keep paying these revenues um, to the news media organisations, right? So that fundamentally changes the competitive landscape in and of itself. And it's, you know, particularly dangerous when we think about the power of journalists um, to um, influence public opinion around these things. So it's super dangerous, I think, to create any kind of regulation that makes news dependent on the health of Google and Facebook. Um, but that's exactly what we've done with this. And, you know, we can see from the way that, you know, Google's been cutting deals and that Facebook's been cutting deals, they're actually pretty happy with how this is, um, they, they got what they wanted through their bad behavior that's being rewarded. And I think there's some real lessons here for the global community in thinking about how to respond because they genuinely were scared by some of the earlier versions of this news media bargaining code. And then there were changes made to it and then they were quite happy. So look at the part, look at the version where they were scared and listen to what Lizzie and Lucy are talking about in terms of, you know, what were the problems with that? But then also look at the things that, you know, could have really helped. And I think that that should be the starting point. How do we take advantage of those potential solutions in order to genuinely change the power balance in a way that does give um, more money for news and what we want, but without entrenching those um, existing um, power dynamics that don't further the public interest. Yeah, I mean, amen um, to a lot of that. <laughs> we, um, I, I guess I, I struggle with how to approach this um, from our perspective, like excessive bigness, <laughs> thanks guys for whoever, those of you who are chiming in the chat, uh, excessive bigness is a problem. But I, I try to um, 
I grapple sometimes as a digital rights advocate with, um, is it, should we be focusing on dismantling the bigness, um, which feels very impossible <laughs> at some, um, you know, at some junctures, or um, should we be really focusing on how to kind of claw back and, and redesign the system um, where we sit? I, you know, this is a fundamental issue because A, we rely on social media for a lot of our movements. Um, and one of the things that we've, you know, we had a really um, tragic outfall of the news media bargaining code here because what Facebook did is they literally shut down um, all all movements on Facebook, basically, they took down any page or group that was sharing or, or just pages, I think they, they took down all pages that were sharing news articles. Um, and news articles were even links to our own website in that broad, they were obviously trying to make a point. Um, but in that interpretation, um, our page disappeared from Facebook overnight. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, they were trying to make a point and I understand it. I absolutely, um, I mean, I was shocked that they would um, go to that length because to me it demonstrated just how fragile it is to actually try and negotiate with these companies. And I, I, I think I commend RightsCon in this community for trying to do that over and over, but ultimately it showed me just how flippant um, they were willing to be with our movements um, and how flippant um, they were willing to be just to respond to government and who they were willing to burn on the back of it. Quite literally, they, they took off, um, as, and I think Lizzie touched upon this, they took off um, you know, information about vaccination sites at that time. Um, they took off um, meteorological reporting centers. So you know, places that let people here in this country know where bushfires are happening. Uh, absolutely critical uh, you know, uh, piece, places for people to get information. Um, we responded to it by actually moving Digital Rights Watch off Facebook. So if you go to Digital Rights Watch on Facebook, you'll just see a note. Um, we kind of have it there as an archive, but you'll just see a note that we don't trust our movement to Facebook anymore. And um, it feels very small to say that because everybody's still on Facebook, but ultimately uh, I do struggle with this because we've built our movements around Twitters and Facebooks. Everything is shareable. When we as digital rights groups, and I'm in many coalitions, I've worked at Access, I've worked with probably many of you in the chat, you know, when we think through it, A, we're using social media and platforms as the channels for a lot of our communications, or B, we're writing press releases and relying on the press um, <clears throat> to get the word of our movements out. So the the sort of, that <laughs> the duality of relying on those two when, when those are sort of turned against us at, at a certain juncture and working together, is, is really problematic. And so when we debriefed at that time with other groups, we said like, it's really time to look at your own assets, your own mailing lists and make sure that you're, what you're, you're in control of the movements you're building um, or you rely on like local um, infrastructure that you can trust. This was a really difficult shift for me because coming from Eastern Europe where I'm from, I really see the power or I did see the power, at least over the past decade, of having um, these huge tech platforms who were running out of democratic countries with sort of democratic principles. I saw the impact that that had on conversation. And at the time, I think those of us in the field and who were studying it, the impact this had on um, the Arab Spring and the revolutions that took place that year, uh, we really saw um, the impact. And I, it's, that's no longer true because A, it's no longer the thriving democracy it once was, uh, and, and the platforms are taking a deep turn. So I guess I've I've almost this has this debate here in Australia has really flipped it for me from seeing them as a global force for good for to actually um, seeing them as an incredibly um, sensitive and risky resource for us to engage with. Um, and and I don't know. And, and James brings up this great question in the chat. Sorry, I sorry that might sound really gloomy. So maybe let's just this question really plays off of that. And that's, uh, do we have thoughts on models to support diverse pluralistic community participation in the information system? Um, which I think it might be where it's at. I think, um, I think that was a really good question. I saw it in the chat as well. And I thought it was important to address because one of the, the exclusions in the media code and to the extent that you end up saddled with a piece of legislation that's similar is that you had to meet certain thresholds in order to qualify to be um, to be made these payments by the digital platforms. Um, it's essentially a forced arbitration scheme 
And the only way you can participate as a, a media organisation, a news organisation, is to meet certain criteria. One of them is size, so you have to have a certain amount of revenue. The other one is content that's for Australian audiences, which actually excludes like quite a bit of consi well, considerable amount of independent journalism that's making use of new digital platforms, uh, that's finding an audience without going through the usual gatekeepers of mainstream media organisations. So it's pretty tragic, I think, that those criteria were imposed. Uh, and it, it kind of is a slap in the face to people who are experimenting with getting to new audiences and building online communities in different ways uh, that I think is one of the great things that comes about as, as, a, result of, as a result of the digital revolution. So um, it's an oversight that exists in our current legislation, and I'd, I'd warn you against it. But I, I absolutely agree with Lucy that this whole experience should be a salutary lesson for anyone who is trying to build a movement or build an audience for a particular kind of content, uh, that it is very dangerous to uh, put all your eggs in the basket of a tech platform. I mean, that lesson has been obvious for a long time, I have to say, but it is obviously easier and understandable why organisations and individuals do this. There are examples of alternatives. And, you know, Rebecca was saying we need to think about creative ways of getting around these things, of coming up with alternatives that don't... Um, that don't just rely on, on politicians doing the right thing by us because they can't be trusted to do that. And I think we're starting to see some experiments in this already. Like we are, we, you know, Digital Rights Watch has gotten on Facebook. Lots of organisations have. There's a great example in New Zealand of a media organisation that got off Facebook as well. In the wake of the Christchurch massacre, they couldn't um, stomach continuing to be on that platform. And so they've built up an audience through a variety of means. You can read about it. Um, I can find the link and I'll post it. Uh, but they haven't seen a, a, a diminution in their audience audience engagement and in part that's because they aren't um, letting the tail wag the dog they aren't letting our algorithms of Facebook dictate the kind of content they produce you know there was a big shift in many news media organizations towards using video because Mark Zuckerberg thought it was a good idea and changed the algorithm to prioritize that kind of content it's not been a good thing for public interest journalism. And then when Mark Zuckerberg changes his mind, you know, media organisations are left with that investment no longer being uh, as lucrative as they suspected it would be because somebody's changed the algorithm. So what I think uh, we should start doing is, is experimenting in building communities and audiences in ways that we can control and uh, in ways that I think should be transparent and accountable as well, but um, don't rely on um, tech overlords to show their benevolence to us. And maybe that is, you know, engaging more in, in um I was about to say older forms of communication like email, um, but also, you know, using a website rather than, say, having everything hosted on a platform that you don't necessarily own or control. There's lots of small changes I think we can make, and this is the time to start experimenting because if you wait until your, your content is stripped or you're booted off the platform, you, you may not have the opportunity to build a more resilient way of being online that is um, that gives you more control over the work that you've produced and the kind of rewards and, and benefits that it creates for society, uh, the kind of audience that it builds for you, how can you make sure that that's within your control rather than Mark Zuckerberg's? And I think this is the time to be thinking about it because you don't want to be waiting uh, to do that at the point at which you've lost access to it already. And we're really starting to see some such interesting experiments around this. Um, so, for example, you know, we've all been assuming that um, Google and Facebook, with all of their surveillance of us, must be really good at selling us shit. Right. That's the idea that we have uh, have got, because, of course, they know all this information. Um, but, you know, there's organizations like the Dutch um, public broadcaster have tried an experiment where they moved away from behavioral advertising entirely as a result of the GDPR. Um, and, and and instead they switched to contextual ads. So, for example, this is like you know, the way they used to do it before all of this fancy ad tech came about. But if, for example, you're reading an article about a new diet, then they, that's maybe a really good time to serve you up um, an ad for a gym membership. And they found that they did not, um, that, you know, that, that they had at least as good results with those ads than the ones that are based entirely on surveillance. Um, and so it's starting to get, you know, kind of exciting to see the, 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 the ways that people and news organizations are rejecting some of the snake oil that we're being offered and that we have been offered for a long time by these organizations. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of that. And that's really what I was um, getting at uh, when I was talking about uh, the potential for news organizations to band together and create their own ad networks. They could do that in a way that's much more privacy protective 
that cuts out um, all of this obscurity that's happening in the middle that protects the privacy, um, you know, uh, uh, as I said, of, of their readers, but and gets them a much bigger share. Right? There's no reason for them to be giving, you know, 50 to 70% of every ad dollar to these companies if they can, you know, offer just as good results in, uh, in a way that doesn't involve all of that. Um, and I just want to point out a question that came through on Twitter as well from the Consumer Policy Research Center. And they were asking us, what do we think of Apple's latest software announcement about more privacy for users? So I reckon this is a super interesting one. If people have been following, um, and if you've got an iPhone, that you might notice that Apple has been asking you much more specifically about tracking and what apps are allowed to do within your phone. Um, this is absolutely freaking Facebook out because um, a lot of its business model is based on that tracking across apps. Um, Lizzie, Lucy, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I find it super interesting that it's an, another enormous company, another monopsonist to its, which itself shakes down particularly software developers and content creators through their 30% VIG that they put on um, every kind of content sale online um, that's driving this. But what do you think? Is there potential here for something interesting? Can I, Lizzie, do you want to jump in or can I? Yeah, you go, you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, Facebook can burn. <laughs> Um, after, I, I think there were, you know, the million million different ways they could have made that point earlier in the year. Um, they could have given us a heads up um, that they're going to take our movements offline to show the government of the scope and reach of the legislation. They didn't do that. So the, the sort of bad faith that I think we've experienced in the past 12 months, um, I, I, I don't mind if their business model is decimated. Um, I, I think where has Apple been with this this whole time? Like, um, you know, making change at an infrastructure level uh, is a genius way. And they've, you know, and we can have different feelings about Apple as a company, but they've, I always say I can trust companies as long as I can see their business model. And I've, the, Apple's business model has always been around privacy and ensuring um, like, you know, the, the whole, they frame themselves in this ecosystem as that, um, sort of knight on a white horse. So I, I trust that they're doing this um, because they believe it serves their usership and themselves. That's fine. <laughs> that not, you know, it's not for a noble ethical reason. Um, it serves them, but I, I'm happy that they're doing it. And I think, you know, just people having that prompt on a system level um, that uh, that they can opt out of is, is a really big step um, because ultimately, and I think everyone, the rights from community, like, um, we've struggled with how to communicate some of these big issues to everyday users. And so their phones actually um, interacting with them <laughs> in that way is, is a really great way um, to raise that awareness. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, think I, should... I, I don't just, oh, sorry. Okay, okay. Well, what I was gonna say was, I think Apple's got its own business model that, that has necessitated this. They wanna preserve their own ecosystem and be the sole arbiter of what information moves in and out of that ecosystem and have control over it. So I understand that it's it's a good test to see if you know what their business model is, whether you can trust this particular manoeuvre. What I would say is maybe I'm just an old school or maybe in my heart I'm a European uh, because I sort of wish that the government would come in and stop these things from happening rather than um, relying on one big company to defend our interests from another big company because I'm a, I'm a perennial sceptic of excessive bigness. So even when it serves us, I think there's a risk that it can be turned against us at other points. Um, and what, what I would prefer to see is lawmakers and politicians serving the interests of the public. And I think uh, regula regulation of people's personal information, how it moves through the web, how companies can use it and, and the limits on that is the critical front line of this kind of discussion because that's what that's what these companies want to get. That's that's Let's stop it at the source, in my view, and, and using a human rights lens to understand why privacy is not just this narrow right of being able to say no to certain things. It's also being able to, to participate uh, collectively with others online in environments of your own uh, determination and that I think is the missing bit so I, I'm pleased that this has worked out it's not it's not bad to to give Facebook um, uh, uh, some damage to their business model because it's a nasty business model but I, I am I am remain concerned that we leave it to companies to do this work when I think governments should be doing a better job themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very similar to um, the point that I was going to jump in with, um, Lizzie. 
uh, Apple, I think, is going to be pretty successful with this, removing some power from Facebook. It's going to increase the power of Apple. And, you know, Apple is more, much more privacy protective than Google, for example, um, in, in the mobile space. But they're more privacy protective, not because of their, some kind of inherent morality to that company, but because they think they can make more money that way. And as soon as that equation changes and they decide that they can, you know, um, maximize shareholder value, short-term shareholder value in another way, that's what they're going to be doing. And that's exactly why we shouldn't be relying on these big companies to be the ones to look after our privacy interests here. It's just not enough. Yeah, 100%. I, I hope I, I hope I eloquently put that as well, that I don't think it's for the right reasons. Um, it just ends up hitting the right spot for my vindictiveness right now. Um, look, I kind of joked at the beginning of this session that um, this is kind of going to be like a rock and roll podcast. Um, so, but we are coming to the end of it. I'm devastated. I feel like we could probably keep this going for another hour or two. So I don't know if you'd like the podcast to come to you, let us know. Well, gosh, we'll do it. Do an episode um, too. Yeah. But just as we wrap, um, I wondered, can we give people a little bit of, um, you know, things to look out for, um, what we're working on in this space that they can keep an eye out for um, and, and follow us? And that's a nice note to end on, I think. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we intend to continue pursuing this in Australia. So we are also very open to discussing with activists around the world who might be confronting a similar proposal. F do feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, and, you know, we're obviously going to be pushing for the other kinds of proposals that were put forward in the report that originally suggested the media bargaining code, including reform of the Privacy Act. And that's going to be one of our key objectives, as well as Lucy was talking about one of our big projects, which is to look at how we could make the web work for people who are producing great content, who are building really important communities. And that's the kind of work that I think we really need to do, kind of the experimentation we were talking about, so that when these proposals get put, we can actually have a meaningful discussion of alternatives rather than uh, just being having the debate on the terms of politicians and tech companies, um, which is not the ideal way to be having these discussions. So I'm hopeful that we can build up that um, knowledge and literacy so that we can um, have these discussions in more nuanced ways. I would just amplify that. I think the solution here is, is going to be civil society, it's going to be people coming together um, collectively in order to demand something better. Uh, so groups working together and just more awareness around the, like, the importance of treating the causes rather than the symptoms of the problems that we're grappling with in the internet space. Um, you can find all of us on Twitter very easily. Um, and yeah, we're all really happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Excellent. Well, yeah, follow Digital Rights Watch uh, Australia. We're, we've tweeted about this as well. Um, thank you, everyone um, who came along to this session. Really appreciate it. It's only an hour or so. Sorry, we didn't get into everything. A huge thank you to Cassandra, who was our technical moderator, um, to my wonderful co-panelist here for joining us. Thank you. And a big shout out to the RightsCon team, whom I miss. This was my first RightsCon, actually, as not an access now staff. So I get to really enjoy, sit back and enjoy and not have to organize. Um, so big thank you um, for providing this space for us and, and we're around. So um, hope to speak to you all at some point. <laughs>